Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's pre-launch status briefing for Orbital ATK's CRS-5 mission to the International Space Station. I'm Katherine Hambleton from NASA's Office of Communication. Uh, Orbital ATK Cygnus cargo spacecraft is loaded with about 5,100 pounds of cargo for the space station and its crew. The Antares rocket is poised to lift off tomorrow at 8.03 p.m. Eastern Time from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Launch Pad 0A here at Wallops Flight Facility. Here to talk about how preparations for tomorrow are progressing are Joe Maltabano, Deputy Manager, International Space Station Program for NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Frank Colbertson, the Space Systems Group President at Orbital ATK, Mike Pinkston, and Terry's Program Vice President and General Manager, Orbital ATK, Sarah Darty, Test Director at Wallops Flight Facility, and Dale Nash, Executive Director for Virginia Commonwealth Space Flight Authority. After opening comments, we will take your questions. For those of us watching TV on TV or online, we'll take questions from social media during the update using the hashtag AskNASA. For those on the phone, uh, please press star one at any time to be entered into the queue. Joel, would you like to start us off? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much and uh, welcome again to the pre-launch status briefing. Uh, the International Space Station program is glad to be back in Wallops. Uh, we've missed these guys and, and we've missed uh, seeing launches from here. The, uh, the Orbital ATK team has done just a fantastic job getting us where we are today and, and we look forward on, on the eve of the launch to seeing the, another Cygnus spacecraft um, berth to the International Space Station. We have a busy week. The, um, this launch tomorrow night starts a, a two-week busy traffic period for the International Space Station. So uh, with, uh, as you heard earlier, uh, about 5,000 pounds coming on board to us. Uh, we have a launch slightly after 8 p.m. local here. We'll have the berthing on the 19th, uh, shortly after 7 a.m. Eastern time. And that'll just be three hours after a launch from, a Kazakh from Baikonur, Kazakhstan with three crew members, a uh, NASA astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts. Uh, so they will launch out of uh, Baikonur, Kazakhstan. They'll be doing a two-day rendezvous. So they'll be arriving at Space Station Friday morning, Eastern Time, uh, shortly, shortly just after uh, 6 a.m. local. That'll bring us back up to six people on board the International Space Station. Uh, that'll be short-lived. Uh, just 10 days later, we'll have the undocking of the crew that launched earlier this summer. They'll be undocking and returning home and uh, ending their mission. And then uh, in early, mid-November, actually November 16th, we'll have another Soyuz launch and we'll go back up to six crew members on board the International Space Station. So with that, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Orbital ATK and, and all the folks that supported them to getting us where we are today. So I'll hand it over to Frank. Thank you very much, Joel, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Wallops. Uh, this is a very exciting time for us at Orbital ATK, and on behalf of David Thompson and the entire leadership team of our company, I wanna thank everyone who has had a part in getting us back to this point, getting ready for our launch after two years. A lot of hard work has gone into this. I especially want to thank NASA Wallops, including the team that weathered the uh, Hurricane Nicole in Bermuda and got it back online for us so quickly, as well as protecting the hardware so well. But everyone here at Wallops, uh, Virginia Space Flight Authority, the range, uh, the safety folks, everyone who has worked to, uh, to make this happen. I especially want to thank the members of the uh, Flight Systems Group, the Antares team, uh, everyone who has worked on preparing the rocket and, uh, and making sure that we are ready to go. Uh, the Cygnus spacecraft is also ready. Uh, it's loaded with about 2,400 kilograms of cargo that the crew eagerly awaits, as always. Every cargo mission is like Christmas, right? And, um, and they never know what they're going to find when they open the hatch. But uh, we'll look forward to that uh, on around the 19th of, of uh, October. Um, as Joel said, uh, launch time uh, is 8.03, and uh, we'll launch uh, – we'll uh, rendezvous and berth at about the same time in the morning on Wednesday as the crew will come aboard on Friday, so about 6 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, this particular Cygnus spacecraft, as all of them have been so far, is named after a former astronaut. Uh, this one is named after Alan Poindexter, Captain of the United States Navy, retired. 
Alan is the second fallen astronaut who has actually participated in the assembly and, uh, and operation of the International Space Station. Alan was a former Navy fighter pilot, a test pilot, and flew on two shuttle missions uh, uh, prior to retiring from NASA. He was on SCS-122 that uh, carried the um, Columbus Laboratory for ESA to be installed on the space station, a great uh, achievement in terms of expanding the cap capacity and scientific capability of the station. And then he commanded um, STS-131 aboard Discovery, which was, interestingly, a cargo mission, and they carried about 6,000 kilograms of cargo to and from the station. And so we think it's very fitting that uh, the uh, Alan is the namesake for this particular Cygnus, and we're very honored to have his name and his picture as a part of this, uh, this uh, spacecraft. Um, we do have a, a video that I'd like to run through that will uh, give you a little bit of an idea of the Cygnus spacecraft, what it's composed. Uh, consists of and uh, and then the operations that we'll be seeing over the next few days. Uh, the service module which is integrated and tested at our Dulles, Virginia facility not too far from here. Uh, you see in this picture the um, uh, solar arrays that are also built by Orbital ATK in their uh, deployment uh, testing and then the uh, Cygnus, uh, the pressurized cargo module itself um, comes from Talis Alenia, Italy and is brought here to Wallops uh, and then mated with the Cygnus service module as you see in this picture here. A very delicate operation, uh, takes uh, quite a while to accomplish but of course very important in making sure the two spacecraft are securely attached together. It's then rotated in the vertical, carried to the fueling facility over on the island um, and uh, then after fueling it is taken into the horizontal integration facility that you see here to be ready, uh, ready for mating to the uh, launch vehicle itself. Uh, one of the last things we do is load some cargo uh, prior to the last closing of the hatch that uh, we call late load. That is things that NASA brings in late that they uh, have been preparing that they need to go on in the last week or two. Sometimes it's time critical, sometimes it's not. This time it's not that time critical, but it was late. Um, once it's assembled to Antares, and Mike will tell you all about the launch in just a moment, uh, they deliver us into orbit. Uh, we separate from the uh, launch vehicle deploy the solar arrays. This particular operation actually takes over 15 minutes. Uh, this is speeded up uh, because Joel doesn't really want me to talk that long. <laughs> and, um, and then over the course of the next two days, uh, we'll raise the orbit as we catch up with the space station and prepare for our final rendezvous and, uh, and berthing. As we approach the station, of course, the, t the crew will be watching us very closely, uh, preparing to snag us with the uh, uh, Canadian um, uh, remote manipulator system or the arm. And then uh, as we get uh, within 10 meters of the station, they'll actually grab us with the end effector and then a very delicate operation of, uh, that consists of mating us with the, uh, uh, in this case, node one, and then opening the hatch to see what's inside. And then they begin the activity of unloading the 2,400 kilograms. They'll load us with disposable car cargo, or in some people's terms, trash, and then deploy us from the space station uh, where we'll fly away and begin our re-entry operations. During the, uh, the eight days following our time aboard the station, we'll conduct a couple of experiments. The first one will be a fire experiment on behalf of Glenn Research Center mm -hmm. to see how fire uh, reacts in zero-g, and then we'll deploy some uh, uh, CubeSats for NanoRacks on the outside of the space station, and that is about real time there. So it's a, pr quite, a, quite an operation. And then once we've completed all of our post uh, uh, orbital activities. We'll re-enter over the Pacific, and this is actual video taken from an aircraft during the OA-6 uh, re-entry. Uh, so we do monitor that, and uh, we hope it all comes down in an uninhabited area. Some of it we really don't want to land on anybody's head, <laughs> nor do you, but uh, it all burns up, and so we uh, feel very confident in what's going on. Again, we're very proud to be at this point, uh, very grateful to all the hard work that's gone into getting us here. And uh, we are ready to go tomorrow and, and uh, go Antares, go Cygnus, and now go Mike Pinkston. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Frank. Uh, you know, I'd just like to start by saying how great it is and how excited we are to be back here at Wallops uh, in an operations mode with, uh, with an Antares rocket on pad 0A uh, getting ready for a launch tomorrow. Uh, I think uh, I've got a short video to talk a little bit about the uh, upgraded Antares rocket. Uh, this this uh, this shows it in a cutaway fashion. 
Uh, I, the most significant upgrade we've made to the to the vehicle is the new uh, RD181. It's going really fast. RD181 engine. Uh, two engines power the vehicle. Uh, the core has two propellant tanks, an RP tank with about 21,000 gallons, a, a LOX tank that was in blue, but it went really fast, <laughs> with about 40,000 gallons. You've already seen the Cygnus. The second stage that I missed uh, is a, uh, a Castor 30XL built by our uh, uh, Orbital ATK team up in Utah. Uh, all of that uh, upper stack is uh, encased by a, a fairing that's about, uh, we're going to do it again, uh, a fairing that's about uh, 10 meters long and uh, uh, deploys once we're up out of the atmosphere. I think that's enough of that one. <laughs> you know, it, it's taken a, a tremendous amount of work uh, to get to this point uh, between the reconfiguration of Antares, uh, you know, getting the pad uh, ready to go. Uh, you know, we had a very successful stage test, which is almost like a launch in and of itself back in May. Uh, and then, you know, preparing obviously this vehicle for launch. Uh, you know, I want to I want to say thanks and commend uh, the entire team, uh, Orbital ATK, uh, the the uh, Dale's uh, uh, Mid Atlantic Regional Spaceport team. Uh, Sarah and the Wallops team for just a you know a tremendous effort, uh, uh, unbelievable hours uh, that went into this and getting us ready for a, uh, a spectacular mission uh, coming up uh, tomorrow. Uh, I think I've got one more video to talk a little bit about the uh, launch operation. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is the vehicle in the HIF. Uh, we made it Cygnus uh, to the launch vehicle Sunday night. Uh, this is the team getting it prepped and ready for fairing mate. Uh, the fairing gets mated, uh, a couple more tests are run, and then we're ready to roll out. This happened uh, Thursday evening. Uh, rolled the vehicle to the pad, uh, got it ready uh, to erect. Uh, the uh, countdown uh, tomorrow will start out at about uh, T minus uh, 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 six hours. Uh, we begin fueling the vehicle uh, about an hour and a half uh, out from launch. Uh, here we are at about T minus 10 minutes. This is where we do our final uh, readiness polls and, and go for launch calls. Uh, at about three minutes and 30 seconds, we'll actually transition to an auto sequencer uh, that controls the countdown uh, all the way down to uh, T0. And then at T0, we have ignition and shortly thereafter liftoff. Uh, the vehicle does a little wiggle movement there to uh, avoid uh, putting the plume on the transporter erector. So, so don't let that stop your heart. It, it does mine, but it's all perfectly normal. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're off with uh, stage one uh, burning. Stage one burns for about three and a half minutes, uh, at which point we'll separate it. Uh, we'll coast for a little bit, uh, and then uh, shortly after uh, stage one separation, we'll come up on fairing separation, uh, exposes the uh, second stage and the Cygnus payload, and then we ignite the second stage. The second stage burns a little more than two and a half minutes uh, to uh, take Cygnus to orbit, and then uh, at uh, burnout, we'll uh, do a little bit of reorientation, and then uh, you didn't get to see it because you saw it on Frank's video, but we'll separate the payload about nine minutes into the mission. Uh, so, you know, that's all we got in store for tomorrow. Uh, you know, the, uh, just just thanks again. Uh, really excited to be here again. And, and uh, you know, my compliments to the entire team. It's taken a, a heck of a lot of work to get to this point. Sarah? Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'll just echo everybody else's comments that we're uh, very excited, the Wallops launch range, to have uh, the biggest show back in town. We've, we've been busy over the, the last couple of years with uh, other missions, but we're always excited to have uh, Ann Terry's uh, back here uh, launching with us. So uh, as far as launch range uh, instrumentation and status goes, uh, we're uh, clear on all of our assets, all of our tracking radars and telemetry sites. Uh, Frank alluded to earlier our Bermuda uh, tracking station after a couple uh, down days due to Hurricane Nicole fared remarkably uh, well in that weather and major kudos uh, to that team uh, there that weathered the storm and was able to get those systems uh, back up and running and they are green and functioning functioning normally uh, at this time. So uh, we're ready to go. Uh, our launch weather officer uh, just a little while ago gave us uh, about as clean of a bill of health as you can for weather. So they didn't give us a 100% chance of no violations. We got 95. Uh, but I think that's uh, a typical uh, weatherman there. Uh, I think their, in their insurance probably requires them never to give a 100% chance of anything. So. 
uh, again, we're, we're excited and uh, we're, we're ready from the launch range uh, aspect and pass it over to Dale. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the, the Commonwealth is, uh, again, uh, very pleased to put on uh, a showcase of, of where the Commonwealth has come in and created a very strong partnership with NASA and Orbital ATK, a very Virginia-centric partnership, really the birth of, of uh, space, our space program in the U.S. Uh, started here at Wallops, but without the investment, significant investment by the Commonwealth, it would all still be suborbital rockets. It's the investment that the Commonwealth put in that enables us the ability to launch uh, the Antares rockets from here, also the Minotaur class rockets. If you go out there, you see signs that say on ramp to the International Space Station that Frank designed that. Uh, we were launching <coughs> another orbital ATK mission within 12 days headed to the moon and we just wanted to make sure that they didn't get confused and go the wrong path with the wrong <laughs> rocket so that's why one sign says moon ahead and, and on ramp to the International Space Station so with that investment we have enabled this national asset that does a lot of capability to to really get into the space big space program at least medium class space program but the entire is fairly big rocket uh, the partnership has only become stronger through this entire effort. Uh, again, Orbital ATK is a Virginia-based, a large Virginia-based corporation. We have uh, strengthened and recommitted our partnership uh, up to and including the uh, uh, governor level and, and uh, CEO with, with Orbital ATK, and that uh, will carry through through at least 2024. We have um, rebuilt a pad. We have... Uh, Probably the never had a cleaner, better looking pad. Looks really good. The whole rebuild efforts with NASA and, and uh, Orbital ATK started within minutes after after the explosion and has continued on through. Uh, we did complete the pad and in, in the rebuild in about 11 months and right at about $15 million, which we uh, shared three ways between NASA, ourselves, and Orbital ATK. The, uh, as, as Mike said, the uh, tests came off uh, extremely well. Uh, the uh, wet dress rehearsal where you fuel it up but don't fire it, the uh, hot fire where you fire it and uh, don't let it go, those were two of the cleanest tests we've ever seen and proved out the system, not only the rebuild of the pad but the modifications we made for the RD-181. And uh, this flow has gone, despite Bermuda, has gone uh, remarkably well here, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, putting putting your rockets out of uh, the uh, NASA Wallops uh, flight facility and playing our part in that. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take questions from those here in the room as well as those on the phone. Again, for those on the phone, please press star one to be entered into the queue at any time. And those who are following us on the internet, please use the hashtag, hashtag AskNASA. All right, uh, let's Dwayne over there. I think this one's from Mike, uh, Jason Warren from SpaceFlightInsider.com. Uh, Mike, you had to make a lot of changes in Terrence to use the RD-181 uh, that includes uh, propellant lines, avionics, pneumatics. Can you tell us a little bit about the processes involved to change from the AJ-26 over the RD-181. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I, uh, you know, it, it, it took a long time, but I'll try to make it brief in terms of an explanation. Uh, but, you know, we, we did have to uh, make some changes to the uh, structures that are used to uh, transfer the thrust loads from the engines to the, the core propellant tanks. Uh, the core structure itself uh, was largely unchanged, uh, you know, aided uh, greatly by, you know, how close a uh, a match the two engines were and, and some of their key characteristics. Uh, we have uh, different control schemes on the engines uh, on the RD-181 than we had on the AJ-26, as well as a significant uh, enhancement in the amount of instrumentation we have on board, uh, both of which drove some fairly significant changes to our avionics in order to, uh, to work together with it. And then uh, obviously some, uh, you know, differences and in unique interfaces uh, from, from a propellants and, uh, and gases and, and commodity uh, perspective that all had to be uh, implemented. So, you know, it, it was a, 
very detailed, uh, meticulous process. But uh, you know, as as evidenced by the stage test, we uh, we got it right, and uh, you know, we're ready to go, uh, ready to go tomorrow. Jeff Faust of Space News. For Joel, um, does that Soyuz mission this week create any constraints for either the launch or berthing of the Cygnus if you don't get off on Sunday night? Good question. So what we would do is, uh, t so tomorrow's launch is good, and then we'd have the berthing on the 19th. If we have to push to Monday, then uh, Cygnus would go ahead and loiter while the Soyuz crew would come in and do their docking. Uh, the Cygnus capability we reviewed at our flight readiness review they had, uh, worst case, 20 days, 20 plus days, and uh, with a nominal uh, ascent, they would have uh, almost 40 days. So uh, not an issue at all, but the Cygnus would stand down and wait for the human space flight to go ahead and, and dock. Other questions? Over here. Hi, Hi. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Frank uh, and Mike, are you working any issues at all with Cygnus or Antares right now? And also, um, Wanted to get your feelings about the launch with the new engines. Are you uh, are you nervous uh, since you haven't done this in two years, or anxious, or, or what are your feelings now uh, returning to flight? Thanks. I'll go first. Uh, we're working no issues on Cygnus. Uh, we're ready to go and, and anxious to get going. Weatherman makes me a little nervous, but but um, <laughs> uh, but no, I think I'm very optimistic. Uh, however, it is a launch, and so any of us who have been in this business a while, you take this very seriously, and, and you watch everything very closely, and you uh, you've got to count on a lot of people. So yeah, we're always nervous, but I'm extremely confident in this team and in this hardware. So I think the crew is going to get their their presence on Wednesday. I think we'll get it off tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add uh, from the Antari side, you know, we ran our last uh, combined systems test with the range uh, this morning. Uh, you know, no, no significant issues coming out of that. We do have, you know, data review that we're, that we're wrapping up this evening and, and uh, you know, but, but as of this point, we're not working any, any major issues and I'm not sure I could have said it any better than Frank did. You know, we're always nervous, but, uh, you know, we wouldn't have a rocket out there if we weren't confident we were ready to go. We'll take our next question from social media. Yep, we have two quick questions from social media. This first one is from at Science Trek, and they're asking, how do you, how do sensitive equipment and experiments get put into the spacecraft so that they aren't damaged during launch? When we receive the uh, the cargo from NASA, it's already pre-packed in uh, bags of various sizes. If it's sensitive equipment, it's also encased in foam, uh, which is uh, good and bad because once it gets up there, the crew has to deal with the foam that it's all packed in. It's like all those boxes that come to, to your front door. You've got to do something with the boxes after you open up your presents. But, but, uh, uh, but they do a very good job of that, and it's packed very tightly in the Cygnus spacecraft uh, with straps that hold it in place. And um, uh, so far, we've had very, very good success with, with the hardware arriving, as far as I know, 100% yep. successfully to the space station. And then when they actually take cargo off the space station, and we can carry up to about 3,000 kilograms mm -hmm. if they so desire when we leave in about 30 days. Um, they also pack it in foam and pack it very tightly so that it doesn't rattle around inside the spacecraft and we can control the center of gravity and make sure that, that uh, everything is where it should be as we re-enter the atmosphere. Uh, great. This next question is from Project Discovery and they're asking, are any of the Antares rocket stages reusable and if not, do they fall into the ocean or burn up? Uh, yeah, none, none of the stages are, are reusable. Uh, the first stage, uh, you know, does fall into the ocean. The, the second stage may stay up a little while, but it'll, it'll not, not very long. It'll come down and burn up in the atmosphere on its, uh, once it's uh, finished. Do we have additional questions here in the room? How about over here, down front? Uh, Gene McCulka for, uh, for Talking Space. I guess for Frank and for Joel. Uh, Frank, when we were here for Orb 2, there was some discussion about uh, a possible six-hour mission uh, to the ISS. And I was just wondering, too, if the team was still being challenged to look at that. And for Joel, do you think that's actually a service NASA is going to need in the future? Thanks a lot. Well, we'd still like to look at that as a possibility, but we really haven't had that requirement laid on us. Uh, I think that it would take some additional uh, work on the part of our spacecraft as well as NASA's ability to coordinate with us to make that happen. Uh, there may be a time in the future where we'd like to get something to the station so quickly that we figure out a way to do that. It, physically, it's possible. Practically, it's difficult. 
and I'll just add, you know, right now what's, what's driving the, the time to get to Space Station is our science requirements. And uh, we've been able to manage within the requirements we've had um, with the, the two-day rendezvous. Um, as that changes, we'll work with Orbital or any other provider to see if we can speed that up from a physics standpoint. You can do that. You just have to pick the right days. The, the Russians uh, generally do that for their Soyuz spacecraft and their Progress spacecraft. Uh, right now, they have a, a new vehicle that they're um, just in their early stages of flying, but uh, they'll go back to a, a four-orbit rendezvous. So, yes. And just one thing to add, uh, the challenge of doing that is the timing as the station goes overhead. Uh, we have a five-minute window tomorrow, and we can actually essentially go any day because we can take up to two days to get to the station. If you want to get there in four orbits, it has to be basically going straight overhead, so you might only be able to launch every three days, and it's got to be right on the second. We've got another question down. Oh. Hi, Ken Kramer for Universe Today and Northeast Astronomy Forum for, for Frank and Mike. Um, can you talk a little bit about your future hopes for this rocket? Okay, you got a more powerful rocket, higher thrust. You got a steady production line with these new RD-181 engines. So I'd like to know uh, what, what kind of new missions, too, could be enabled by this? What other satellites can you launch? The other day you announced um, a satellite uh, you're going to launch on a proton. Why, why not on Antares. So to talk a little bit about that, your hopes and what, what you can do with Antares in the future. Thanks. Cover the payload part. Yeah. The, on the satellite side, um, uh, Cygnus is very compatible with Antares and we are actually proposing the use of Cygnus for other applications in low Earth orbit uh, to include satellite servicing and, and, and other things that are coming in the future. Antares would continue to be the ideal launch vehicle for most of those missions. Um, for other spacecraft, uh, for example, the, the uh, communication satellites that we build are also in my group, but in order to get to a, a geostationary orbit, it takes a different upper stage than what the current Antares has on it, so we'd have to modify the rocket, and Mike can talk about the future of, of that. But we've looked at a, very, uh, a number of different variations, and as I said, the Cygnus can be used for a lot of different purposes. The technology that we use on the Cygnus can also be used for a lot of different missions and a lot of different objectives, and we are, we are evolving that into other spacecraft <clears throat> yeah and uh, you know I'd, I'd add uh, you know there's nothing about the Antares rocket that makes it uh, you know unique to the to the CRS mission certainly and uh, you know we've got aspirations to uh, to market and, and and sell it for for other uh, other satellite applications uh, anything in the in the medium class um, you know, as, as Frank said, you know, those, a lot of those applications would require, you know, development of, a, of a, uh, a, an alternate upper stage capability. Uh, we've got thoughts on that that, uh, uh, you know, we could, we could put into work uh, in the future. And, you know, certainly in our current configuration, uh, you know, we've, we're looking at, you know, NASA science missions. Uh, the uh, uh, you know, certain commercial opportunities that, that may emerge, uh, you know, I think in all cases, uh, you know, a successful flight is, is going to be a, a, a you know, a, an entry requirement to, to any of that. And so that's why we've been just, you know, squarely focused on, on the OA-5 mission coming up. But, uh, you know, certainly in the future we're looking to do more with Antares than, than just CRS. Thank you. All right. We're actually going to go take a question from the phone first, and then we'll go up here in the front. Irene Klotz with Reuters, your line is open. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first is for uh, uh, Ms. Nash. Uh, after the accident, there was quite a controversy over payments for repairs uh, for um, equipment and facilities that were owned by the state, uh, not U.S. government and not Orbital, um, which you didn't have insurance for, for this mission. Has uh, Mars now purchased insurance? So, how much? Thanks. We uh, we worked through that. Uh, we we are covered by insurance. Say what we believe the uh, maximum possible damage is, and uh, have that in our uh, agreements uh, with with Orbital ATK and uh, with a, with concurrence from NASA. Okay, we'll go to the question down front here. Hi, uh, Jeremy Cox with uh, DelmarvaNow.com. Um, you all have talked about 
um, the hot fire tests occurring, but and that these are new motors being used for the first time with this particular spacecraft. Is it unusual to not have a, uh, a test flight under these circumstances? I don't think it's unusual. Um, you know, we, we certainly feel like that uh, we, uh, you know, first of all, the engines themselves are all tested uh, to the full flight duty cycle before they're delivered to us. Uh, and then, you know, the, the stage test that we conducted in uh, back in May uh, is a fully integrated test of a, you know, fully flight-like uh, first stage. Provides us uh, significant data. There was a ton of data, uh, including extra instrumentation that we added just for the test that's beyond what we typically put on a flight vehicle. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time uh, digging through it. So, uh, you know, we're, we're completely confident that uh, that gave us the, uh, uh, the information and the data we needed to, uh, you know, really assure ourselves that uh, the, the vehicle is ready to fly. And the payload side of the equation feels good about it too. Uh, the first stage has been changed, but we understand those changes and we feel like all the tests uh, covered the risks that people have uh, been able to uh, think of that we'd have to address. And we have a lot of experienced people in this uh, program who have, who have flown rockets for the first time. And these engines have flown in slightly different variations right. on, other, on other rockets. As far as everything from the first stage up, the changes to that are very minor. The spacecraft itself is different than what we were flying in the first part of this program, but we've flown it twice on another launch vehicle. So we feel very comfortable, comfortable that the entire system has been wrung out. Uh, we do understand the risks, and, uh, and we have a lot of confidence that it's going to work as, as designed. And I'll jump in as well. You know, NASA has been integrated with the orbital ATK team. We've had uh, people from our Marshall Space Flight Center, engine experts, people from the Launch Services Program out of Kennedy Space Center. We've traveled to Russia with this team. Uh, we feel confident as well with the orbital ATK plan. All right, we're going to take a question here, and then we've got one down in the middle here. Thank you, Mark Harmon with uh, SaveManSpace.com. Uh, two questions. Uh, I want to follow up from Ken's question. Could you uh, launch uh, CubeSats with any unused uh, cargo uh, weight? And number two, um, you had the Sapphire experiment on the previous launch. Um, it'd be interesting to know the results of that, and is there a follow-on on this current uh, flight? I'll take that. Uh, yeah, as we showed in the video, we did have the Sapphire on the previous mission. We have a, a very similar experiment on this mission also that, as I mentioned, we were going to conduct shortly after unberthing from the space station. And then it'll take us a few days to download the data from that, the video, et cetera. It's a different configuration of the samples and the uh, burn rates that they expect to see, but it will be a similar experiment. And I think it'll also be very informative to the designers for future spacecraft. Uh, the CubeSats, as I said, we're going to deploy uh, an additional set of NanoRax CubeSats on this mission, just as we did last time. Uh, that's what the video was that you saw from the previous mission. Uh, we will do it from above the station this time rather than below. That'll give them a little longer time in life, or, or orbit life. Uh, but, uh, but we'll be well away from the station by the time that occurs. And uh, it should be a, a very exciting time for the folks who have built the experiments that are going to go on those, that are on those uh, CubeSats. And we can do that on every mission if we uh, are asked to do so. Yeah, so we're deploying uh, 45 kilometers above the space station. And that was in a direct request from the, the science and research community from the owners of these satellites. They said, hey, we, we need more orbit lifetime. Can you go above ISS? We worked with uh, the different teams. We worked with Orbital, uh, Orbital ATK to make sure we can get what we needed. And uh, it's a huge success story. We also had a science briefing just before this briefing in which we had investigators talk about those two investigations specifically. You can catch that on YouTube. And we'll also have those investigators back tomorrow for reporters that want to do one-on-one -on -one interviews. You can sign up for those at the media check-in station if you're interested in learning more about those as well. And now we'll go down here to the middle. Hi, uh, Jared Hayworth with We Report Space. It's a question for Mike. Uh, Frank had mentioned the five-minute launch window that you have. For the upgraded Antares, what does the recycle time look like in the case of a hold during the terminal count? Um, do you have the opportunity to reset the launch vehicle and try more than once in that five minutes, or is it kind of a one-and-done scenario? Yeah, you know, realistically, once we get to, you know, that far down in the count, we will select a, a launch time. Uh, you know, it's very unusual that you would have a situation where, you know, a, a 
one or two minute hold would would save the day, but it certainly isn't uh, you know out of the question. Uh, and we we certainly use that five minute window to work around colas and and uh, other things like that. Uh, but it it you know it's it's pretty tight. You, know, you miss that five minute window, and then we're done for the day. But uh, we do have the capability to turn around uh, after a scrub. Dale and his team have all the right commodities and everything ready to go, and uh, you know we should be able to give it a, give it a shot the next day. And that was uh, part of what we took advantage of in the uh, downtime to really upgrade our capabilities. So essentially, we can go uh, recycle, 24-hour recycle, day after day after day after day. The people will time out before <laughs> the, the facilities. And that's the way you want it. Yep. But to address your question, we can't back up in the time or in the countdown. That's right. If that's what you're trying to, okay. to get to. Because uh, for safety and reliability, and hardware reasons, uh, we just keep continuing forward until we get to this point. We're going to try to take a question from the phone, and then we'll go over here. Irene, your line is open. She didn't get her second question. Okay, thank you. Um, it's Irene Fox with Reuters again. Um, I'm going to just ask these two questions together and get cut off. Um, the first, uh, the, I wanted to ask uh, Frank about the um, FAA uh, launch license. There is a um, pretty significant hike in how much liability insurance needs to carry for this flight from 6 to $90 million. Um, Is that because of the rocket configuration or because you have a fancy pad now? And uh, for Joel, um, what uh, manifest changes were there to OA-5 following the SpaceX September 1 accident and temporary grounding Dragon. Thanks. I mean, I'm not familiar with uh, the issue you're asking about on the uh, uh, insurance requirements on the launch license. I think it's pretty much the same as it's been on previous CRS-1 missions. There may be some changes when we get into CRS-2, but, uh, uh, but right now the licensing is the same as it has been, and the analysis uh, being conducted by both the FAA and the range is actually better than it's been in the past, more sophisticated. They put a lot of effort into getting ready for uh, this particular launch and increasing our launch probability. We're very happy with the, uh, the teamwork between all the parties involved here. And on the manifest question, uh, we originally had some ballast that we were flying on this vehicle. Uh, we've removed all that ballast and we've replaced it with uh, crew supplies, food, clothing, some computer resources, some up upgraded laptops, and then some a very small amount of uh, EVA hardware, extra vehicular activity hardware. All right, we'll go down here. Hi, my name is James Robertson. I'm with the NASA Social Group. Um, my question is about the Sapphire experiment. Um, to, are there, excuse me, are there any um, special considerations that the ISS crew has to make when loading the Cygnus back up um, for deberthing and um, to not, you know, mess with that experiment? And um, is there any? Um, Just keep. Something is there any um, you know uh, would there be any adverse effects if say that experiment set the whole <laughs> container on fire um, before uh, reentry? Thank you. The way the experiment is designed and the and it's been tested extensively is that it cannot activate itself prior to leaving the space station. It has several inhibits that keep it from receiving power or being able to, to ignite any of the material. And we're very confident that that's going to work that way. Uh, the <coughs> NASA Glenn team has designed it that way. We've integrated it into the space station with the right sp our space vehicle with the right safeguards. The, all the crew has to do is make sure that the, uh, the ventilation uh, paths are, remain open and they stay out of the keep out zones when they load the, uh, the cargo and otherwise they don't need to touch it or, or um, uh, do anything to make it ready to activate when we leave the, uh, the space station. So we feel like it'll go just like it did last time. Yeah. On and when we did this on the last mission we had no issues with uh, maintaining the keep out zones and the ventilation requirements. We'll go back here. Uh, Arsenio from Team NRS Arduino. I'm part of the National Social Group. I got a question. Why were there not many photos available of the damage to the, uh, to the pad after the disaster? There were lots of photos. <laughs> <laughs> All I saw was one very distant one and one that just barely showed the crater by the pad. 
can't help you there. I found them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where you look, but I saw photos everywhere on the uh, uh, media. Do we have any other questions in the audience? We have one down here in the front. Gene McCall for Talking Space. Uh, for Dale Nash, uh, this launch is going to be, uh, we have an election going on. This launch is um, going to be looked at all over the place, including over in D.C. What do you hope that uh, folks over in D.C. that are you know, trying to go ahead and get a budget together for all this are going to go ahead and look at it, uh, 803, and notice this thing arcing over? What do you hope their thoughts are going to be? Thanks. Well, I, I spent a lot of time launching uh, shuttles in Florida, Frank, and, and a few times, several times. And uh, there, there are tremendous advantages to being within driving distance of Washington, D.C. I think we have two buses now coming down from D.C. with staffers who are very, very interested. Uh, and it, it is always a tremendous advantage to have someone come down and experience a launch versus seeing it. As all of you know, there's a, there's a huge difference. So uh, we're, we're very, very confident. Uh, we think it will put on a great show. And uh, nighttime launches are always really good, too. So uh, we, we hope it puts on a good show for everyone. They enjoy some of the Chincoteague oysters as they're down here. And, and uh, everyone enjoys it. And we get a wide viewing angle where a lot of people get to go out on Capitol Hill or elsewhere in the uh, Northeast here and have a, or Mid-Atlantic and have a good look at the launch. Yeah, Kate and Sandy, you got over 100 people coming from the Hill, right? From Washington, 130 they said. So there'll be plenty of people from Washington here to watch it. And for those dozen or so people in Washington who are watching this press conference, you can go anywhere <laughs> on a high hill and look to the, to the southeast at, at about 8.05 and see us arise above the horizon. Maybe there's 20, I don't know. <laughs> we'll take a question here in the middle. We've got a, a time for a few more questions. Uh, this is Michael Martins from the Richmond <laughs> Times Dispatch. I have a question for Dale Nash. Uh, given, given the state's investment, you talked about uh, a Virginia-centric um, program. What are the opportunities uh, that this offers for the, for the state, you think, as a business uh, investment in the facility? Well, it, uh, Wallops has always had a significant impact here, but it has been palpable even in the four years that I have been here, the, the impact that the uh, additional uh, work and employees from Orbital ATK, ourselves, and then our, our suppliers that have begun to migrate up here has had on the area. It, uh, if, if you look at uh, this rocket, I, I think we could get uh, very busy here in the next few years. Uh, the, this is not me, this is the Chincoteague Chamber of Commerce <laughs> states that uh, each launch is the equivalent of a pony swim. And those of you who are familiar with Chincoteague, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the biggest uh, event here. Which pony? Uh, what, one thing that uh, you, you asked about CubeSats, but one thing that, that we agreed to in our long-term uh, agreement with Orbital ATK is uh, we, Virginia, get the equivalent of 12U CubeSats each launch after we, we get, I mean, not right now, but as, as we get through all uh, the approval and everything, the safety, and they will, they will be on the second stage. So it will be a short time in space, and we are trying to get that to pocket cubes. So you can imagine 96 pocket cubes on every launch and the impact that would have on, on the STEM. And obviously, Virginia will have a high preference for, for those pocket cubes, but it won't be too long before we have exhausted uh, the people who want to come uh, in, in Virginia, and I see that spreading out uh, well across the nation, maybe internationally. So we're, we're very excited about that and the uh, commitment from Orbital ATK to let us pursue that as part of the impact, uh, not only economically that we get for Virginia, but, but the, the whole STEM arena. If I could just clarify, what Dale is talking about is not satellites built by companies or, or large organizations, but satellites and experiments designed by students all the way down to elementary school. Lots of high school students are building CubeSats, college students, and so we will be exposing or enabling the exposure of space experimentation to people all the way through the school systems, spreading out radially from, from here at Wallops. I think it's a big deal. 
Okay, I think we have time for one more question. We have one over here. We have one over here. <clears throat> Jeff House, Space News. Um, for Mike, just curious, um, will the launch of the re-engined uh, Antares look uh, any different from the older versions? Will it be faster, brighter plume, anything that you might notice compared to the previous ones? <laughs> Uh, well, the, the you know the thrust to weight is a, a little bit higher, so it may come off the pad a little faster. Uh, this thing comes off so slow, I'm not sure that a little faster is gonna <laughs> gonna be noticeable. But uh, uh, you know, beyond that, I don't think you'll I don't think you'll tell a difference. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in my in my video commentary, it'll actually because of the higher performing engines. You know, where you'll really notice it is at the uh, you know the end of the mission we'll get to we'll have Cygnus in orbit about a minute earlier than we uh, would have on a, a previous version of Antares. Don't have to hold our breath as long. Yeah that's <laughs> that's always appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> that's all we have time for today I'd like to thank everyone for joining us if you're on the east coast uh, there's a chance you might be able to see the launch from where you are uh, check out the viewing maps online and you can find those maps and more about the mission at nasa.gov slash orbital atk and uh, also tune in tomorrow night launch coverage begins at 7 p.m thank you thank you